Amen. Praise the Lord. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of John, chapter number one. As we continue through the book of John on Sunday mornings, John and chapter number one. And when you found your place, if you stand together with me, please, for the reading of God's word, we're going to begin in verse number 35. John and chapter number one, beginning in verse number 35, the Bible says, And the next day after John stood and two, and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and said unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? And he saith unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And his first, he first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Caiaphas, Cephas, which is being interpreted a stone. Lord, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, as we look at your scripture this morning. Lord, that you would help us uh, illuminate to us the truth. Lord, we do not come here for a social gathering. Lord, we do not come here out of any religious uh, duty. Lord, we come here to worship our God. We come here to honor our Lord. We come here to hear a message from you today so that our lives may be different. Lord, if you need to change our thinking, Lord, I pray that you would do that. Lord, if you need to change our actions, I pray that you would do that. Lord, if you need to change our emotions, I pray that you would do that. Lord, we come here today desiring to hear from you so that you might make us more into the image of your Son. We thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. Jesus, John has already baptized Jesus at this point, and even as we learned last week there on the Jordan, Jesus is walking up, and John says, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. This is Passover week, and the sequence of days has continued as they came out in the uh, the Pharisees and had sent those to question John, who are you and is it about you? And John said, it's, it's not about me, it's about the one who's coming after me. I'm simply making the way straight for the one who will come. And Jesus the next day comes and John says, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. If you remember that Passover week as, as we painted the picture that uh, so many were coming to Jerusalem bringing their lambs to sacrifice bringing their lambs to be slain, uh, uh, to be slaughtered there at that Passover week. And, and uh, there would be great people bringing their lambs. And even the Romans, uh, the emperor, would be sending a sacrifice to the temple. It was their tradition to send a, a sacrifice, uh, and not only a lamb, but also send uh, money to, to the temple. And what prestige must have been going with that entourage as the leaders of the Romans and, and the, those that they would send would bring that sacrifice. And how impressive it would be to watch all those lambs being brought there. And uh, if you study there and how many would be sacrificed. And, and the reason for that sacrifice, the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And, and there was an atonement taking place. A rolling over of the sin from one year to the next was the purpose of those Old Testament sacrifices. In the midst of the backdrop of the Passover and all the lambs that were coming, here John the Baptist will declare, Jesus not bringing a lamb, Jesus not a lamb, but he is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And just, in, just so you understand, Jesus was not simply an atonement. Atonement means a covering. Atonement means a rolling over to next year. Atonement means putting off the sin until it must be dealt with. Jesus is not the atoning lamb. Jesus is the redeeming lamb. And he takes away the sins of the world. That's different than putting off the sins till next year. Uh, what a concept for John uh, to be able to declare Jesus, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. How shocking that must have been. And you wonder sometimes about those scenes. What happened immediately after John said that? The Bible continues the scenes the next day. The next day. What happened? Right? I, I, this is what I imagine. 
John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. And there are people, there are all sorts of reaction. There were some of those, what is he talking about? He doesn't know what he's talking about. And there were others that were wondering about it. And they were, and they were perhaps confused. And many that were looking for it and searching for it. And all of the different uh, responses to it. And can I tell you what a blessing it is that the next day Jesus comes again. The next day, Jesus comes walking past them again. Think about this concept. The first time you heard about Jesus was not the last time you heard about Jesus. Jesus came walking again. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't hold you responsible to your first response to his name? He came walking by and perhaps there was a preacher, perhaps there was a parent, perhaps there was a co-worker, perhaps there was somebody that introduced you to Jesus, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, and you had uh, many different types of reactions. Well, what's he talking about? I'm not sure about that. I want to learn more about that. I wonder about that. You had all different types of reactions, but here's what happened. You didn't come to any conclusion. Yeah. Jesus just kept on walking by. That's the picture that is painted. He comes walking by the Jordan. John said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. And there he goes. <laughs> there he goes. Jesus is looking for those that would follow him. And so in order to follow him, Jesus keeps on going. And I imagine as Jesus gets out of sight, there is all sorts of people that are going, Wow, that was something. <laughs> right. Wow, that wild man there said he's the Lamb of God. I wonder if that means that he thinks he's the Messiah. Can you imagine the theological discussions that went on? The intellectual discussions that went on? But here was the result. They all stayed and Jesus kept going. Yeah. They all discussed it. And Jesus was out of sight. And Jesus was gone. But the next day, he came again. The next day, he passed by them again. And the message doesn't change. The message is not enhanced. The message is not, you know, we got to crank it up a notch so they'll get it. Guess what the message is? The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. It's the same message every single day. And here with John the, John the Baptist is there on the Jordan. He's continuing to baptize. And the Bible says in verse number 36, and looking upon Jesus. If you look those words up in, in the original language, it's not just a casual observance of somebody walking by. It was, a, it was a study of him. It was a really a, a, a inquisitive looking at, looking at him. He just told us in the previous day, he said, I didn't know who he was until God revealed him to me. It's interesting that John knew who Jesus was, but didn't know he was the Messiah until God revealed it to him. These two disciples who will be... Andrew, and the other one, no doubt, is John. You, you'll see that John will be in the habit in his book of not naming himself. He won't name himself through the entire book. He will have some names for himself, the disciple that Jesus loved, but he doesn't name himself. So it's interesting that this other disciple of John the Baptist is not named, which would lead us very clearly to believe that it was probably John, the apostle. And we forget that John the Apostle, we're going to make sure we get this right. We got John the Baptist and John the Apostle. They're two different people, okay? John the Baptist is saying, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. John the Apostle is writing about it some many, many years later. And John the Apostle was there witnessing it at the same time. So if you're confused, I'll be confused, we'll be confused together. Amen. So John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. John the Apostle and Andrew are there, disciples of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is watching Jesus and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. He, he's looking at him. Behold, the Lamb of God. And John and Andrew, we forget that John is also the cousin of Jesus. John, the apostle's mother, is Mary's sister. And so he would have known who Jesus was. He knew who Jesus was. He, 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 would have, he probably would have traveled with the family to the feast. Can you imagine him thinking back to when Jesus was 12 and they're going to the feast? And all of a sudden, Mary and Joseph are, are coming around to, to his family. Have you seen Jesus? No, I haven't seen Jesus. Have you seen Jesus? It's very possible that Andrew also knew, who worked closely, Andrew and Peter worked closely with John and James in, in the industry. Very possible they also knew who Jesus was. They lived in a similar region. 
Did, did you see Jesus? I haven't seen Jesus. They look for him. Well, we know where Jesus was. He was back at the temple. He's, he, was, he was doing, he was talking to the elders and talking to the scribes and they were amazed at the things that he knows. And he said, I must be about my father's business. No doubt John thought Jesus was unique. John thought Jesus was interesting. John thought Jesus was something, but he didn't know he was the Messiah. He didn't know who he was. And there comes a point where we must be educated by the Spirit of God. Can I help you with something? It is not my desire or my hope to convince you of anything intellectually. Because I'm going to be honest, there's people a whole lot smarter than me. And my wife says, amen. There's people a whole lot smarter than me. I, I can, I'm not going to try to convince you of anything intellectually. I'm not going to try to convince you of scientific proofs of Jesus being the Messiah. I'm not going to try to convince you of uh, scientifically or, or even historically, though we may use it as a, as a backdrop of what we're talking about. I'm not going to convince you historically that Jesus is the Messiah. I'm just going to tell you what John the Baptist said. Behold, the Lamb of God. And you may know who Jesus was, is. You may have been introduced to Jesus. You may know he's Jesus, the baby in the manger. You may know that he's, you know, closely connected to the Christian religion. You may know him historically. You may know about him. But the question is, do you know him as your personal Savior? There has to come a point of decision. And here's John and Andrew followers of, uh, of John the Baptist, and John is watching, scrutinizing, looking at the person of Jesus, and again will declare, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. And he, Jesus keeps on walking. Can you see Jesus walking past the crowd? Hey, we know from, uh, from the picture of, scri uh, of Scripture that there were many that came out to hear John the Baptist. There were some that came out to be baptized, others that came out to scrutinize, some that just came out to observe. There are all sorts of people there. Jesus is walking past them, second day in a row, that John says, Behold the Lamb of God, and Jesus keeps on walking. The only difference is, this time somebody follows him. Look what it says in the text. It says in verse number 37, And two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Two disciples heard him speak. Hey, listen, the message is going to be real simple this morning. The message is going to be real simple this morning. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot say that you have faith and trust in Jesus until you met him, until you know him, until you have put your faith and trust in him. And there is going to be a decision that's going to take place in your life. And prayerfully, many of you can look back to the point of that decision when Jesus came by. You say, Jesus is no longer walking by. Friend, Jesus is still coming by. And he's still being presented. And he's still being declared as the Lamb of God. We may not see him physically, but I promise you, he is there. And he is still the Lamb of God. And he still takes away the sins of the world. And there are still crowds of people that are gathered around for all sorts of different reasons. And through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus comes by. And you go, well, that's interesting. As sometimes I've had people, as I get done preaching, and they walk out and they'll say, that was something. I'm like, is that a, is that a compliment? Or is that, uh, you know, that was something. Well, amen, brother. Uh, praise the Lord. Or I'll hear this one quite a bit. I've never heard it like that before. <laughs> amen. Amen. I'm just going to take it as a compliment. And Jesus is still being presented, and Jesus is walking by. Friend, when Jesus comes by, you can hear him about him. You, you can say, that's, uh, that's powerful. That's interesting. But until you put your faith and trust in him and begin following him, it's not going to make an impact into, his life, into your life. Now understand this. Understand what happens. This is, the, this is the idea of the modern Christian. When Jesus does something for me, I'll start listening to him. If Jesus would just come down and reveal himself to me, I'd pay attention. Luke chapter number 16 says, listen, all you need is the word of God. If you won't believe the word of God, you won't believe it even if one come back from the dead. All Jesus is going to do is come by and have the truth be presented. The truth is going to be presented. Now, let me give you this illustration. Brother Omar, stand up here for a second. Here's, here's Omar in the crowd. Jesus comes by 
And John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God. And you be one of the disciples, John, Andrew, whatever you are. And, and Jesus is coming by. Now, you notice, what does Jesus say in this passage? At this point, what does Jesus say? Nothing. Nothing. That speaks volumes because Jesus is still depending on other people to declare his deity and his God, his, 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 his divineness and his the idea that he's Savior. He's still depending on you and me as he goes by. He's still depending on us to declare the Lamb of God. And if for him to hear, somebody else besides Jesus is going to declare. Okay, and so here's Jesus walking by. John declares, Behold the Lamb of God. And here, John or Andrew, whoever he is, begins to follow Jesus. He's following Jesus. Now, how long does he follow Jesus? And the idea kind of gives us the idea they went a little ways, at least. And when did Jesus start talking to him? Now, don't get me wrong. There's going to be other people that Jesus is going to come by and say to them, Follow me. Follow me. But for John and Andrew, is they begin following him. His deity and his messiahship is declared, and they leave John and begin following him. Right. You say, was it really a point of faith? You know what Andrew says to Simon? <coughs> Come see. We have found the Messiah. This is an act of belief. As they leave John, what they're comfortable with, where they are at, they say, okay, that's the land of God, I'm going to follow him. That's the land of God, here we go, I'm going to follow him. And as they begin following, here Jesus turns around and says to him, What seek you? What seek you? And there's a whole lot of Christians that wonder why God doesn't speak to them very much. They wonder why there's not a lot of uh, information communicated from even from his word and the coming preacher. I'm just not getting anything from God's word. I'm not learning anything. It seems like it seems like he's so distant. Can I tell you who Jesus is going to turn around and talk to? Those that are already following him. Those that have given up the position where they are and have become following him, then he's going to turn around and speak to them. Because if you stay over here, behold the Lamb of God. And he can think, act, say whatever he wants. But as Jesus goes by, if he stays there, guess what? Communication between him and Jesus is going to break down. Right. Jesus, even though the Bible teaches us that preachers are supposed to lift up their voice like a trumpet and shout. It's biblical, by the way. And so they're, they're supposed to shout and they're supposed to proclaim Jesus. You know how God speaks? In a still, soft voice. Get this. Jesus is not a shout. Now, he has strength and ability. We're going to see that when he clears out the temple. <laughs> but Jesus doesn't speak like this. Hey, what's seeking? What do you want? That's not the way Jesus speaks to his followers. That's not the way Jesus communicates. Now, he might send circumstance and difficult and heartache and even punishment into his life. Into his life. But you know what Jesus wants? Jesus wants... When you, when you have made that decision to give your life to Him and to serve Him, He's made that decision that as you begin following Him, he, when you get to a place and He turns around and He says, what seek you? You think Jesus noticed they were following? You think Jesus went around, whoa. <laughs> really? You guys started following Him. Jesus knows. You will never sneak up on Jesus. You will never be a surprise to Jesus. But you're going to have a hard time hearing His voice if you're not following Him. You're going to have a hard time hearing His voice. And unfortunately, I, I have dealt with many a heartbroken Christian, and at times I've been that heartbroken Christian that cannot hear the voice of Jesus. And I think it's Jesus' fault because He passed me by. I mean, I was there doing my thing. I was trying to do what was right. I was following John the Baptist. I was trying to do what was right. And Jesus came by and he just kept on going. Because he wants me to follow him. In order for that to take place, there has to not just be a willingness. There has to not just be a willingness to recognize 
him as a deity, not just willingness to recognize him as God and being Messiah and being the Lamb of God which taken away the sins of the world, not just recognizing who he is positionally, but recognizing that he's also the Lord of my life and the one to be followed. And if I'm going to honor him and glorify him, I must move from where I am to where he is. There's a whole lot of Christians that want to follow Jesus from a distance. Right. I mean, I can believe in Jesus too, but I, don't don't go crazy with that. I mean, I believe in Jesus too, but I don't really want it to affect my life. I believe in Jesus too, but you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not gonna believe what I'm doing. This is just the first step. This is John and Andrew and, and, and Simon or James and, and Peter. They're going to leave it all behind, aren't they? They're going to leave their nets and everything. And what we feel is such a daunting thing to follow Jesus. Can you see the genuine childlike faith? As John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. And John and Andrew go, Okay, we'll follow it. We'll follow it. Now, as they follow him, as they follow him, Jesus turns back and says, What seek ye? Oh man, can you imagine what Christians would say if Jesus asked that? What seek ye? Alright, got me a list. Uh, I've got to need a race. My family's in a little bit of turmoil. The marriage, you know, help her out. You know. I've got a list. I've got a list. <laughs> Of things that is going to make my life better. I got a list of things that Jesus can fix and help and, and solve. Can I tell you the genuineness of their response? He said, What seek ye? They said, Master, where dwell thou? We just want to be with you. We just want to know you. We, we just want to spend time with you. We just want to be taught by you. We, we just want to learn from you. Can you, can you imagine it? I think this is an incredible scene. Mm -hmm. What seek ye? Master, where, where do the dwellers? I was reading some commentators, and one of them said, well, uh, they wanted to have a private conversation, so the discussion would not be public. Man, you've got to do a whole lot of reading into the scripture to get that. <laughs> Here's what I think. They wanted to go with it. Right. Right. Wherever you're going, that's where we're going. Right. Where's Moses out? That's what it says. That's what it says. That's all it says. Mm -hmm. And so he says, and so Jesus said, Come and see. Come and see. You ever want God to give you the plan of what's going to happen next before it happens? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> you ever want to see thing? I want to know what's going to happen. All right, here's what's going to happen. <laughs> Yeah, can I tell you, that's not the life of faith? You know what the life of faith is? Come and see. Come and see. Now, you've got to understand this concept. This is, this is an incredible concept. I, I know it's simple. And you might say, well, preacher, you're oversimplifying it. I truly believe this. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And so when Jesus says, what seek thee, he's looking for that genuine desire. I just want to be with thee. This is the idea. If I am with Jesus, then my life is going to be right. My, my, my possessions are going to be right. My marriage is going to be right. My children are going to be right. Everything's going to be right because he is transformative. Jesus transforms love. So instead of asking him for a list of things that he could fix, because he knows better what needs to be fixed, they just say, we just, where, the, where do you want to stop? Mm -hmm. Can you understand in that statement what they're, what they're willing to give up? What they're willing to turn aside? All these things that Jesus will later teach them, they are acting upon already by faith. They don't even know it yet. Hmm. He'll teach them, lest a man hate his father, and his mother, and his brother, and his sister. He cannot be my disciple. Man, that seems like a hard statement. But here, they're saying, we just want to be with you. Listen, the very best thing that you can do for your life is be with Jesus. Right. <laughs> the very best thing you can do for your marriage is be with Jesus. The very best thing that you can do for your children is be with Jesus. 
Because understand this. If you are following Jesus, you're going to end up where Jesus is. Right. <laughs> you're following Jesus. Now here's what happens. Look at Jesus for a little bit. Here's what happens. Let's do that. Let's do that. Let's do that. Okay? Jesus says, follow me. And I genuinely want to follow him. I really do. I desire to follow him. He says, what seek is that? Where, where dwellest thou? Can I tell you, can you understand that probably where he's going was not a few feet away? He didn't say, over there. He said, come and see. Which meant there was a time of journey. And here's what we do. I'm just going to tell you. Here's what we do. As he begins to go, we follow, we follow, we follow. Wait a second. I got to hold on. You, you, you wait for me. I'm gonna, I got to take care of this problem. <coughs> I, oh, I got to follow this opportunity. Yeah. I, I, I got to fix this. I gotta change this. Would you just hold on, Jesus? Jesus doesn't hold on. He just keeps going. No, actually, you can stop it. Okay? Jesus is gonna keep going. Because the whole concept is my life is not driven by Jesus benefiting me. My life will be driven by me following him. And this is how we do it. This is the way that we operate as a Christian. Okay, back over here, I put my faith and trust in Jesus. And now I've got my little Jesus tool. I wear it as a bracelet, maybe a hat, if I'm crazy, a t-shirt, you know. And I come along, and here we go. I'm like, all right, Jesus, oh, no, hold on a second. We got something over here to fix. All right, I'd like you to take care of this for me. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. I need you to fix her. Because she's really been giving me some problems. Okay. And we think that we can direct Jesus to be my little tool to benefit my life like it's all about me. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. I try to be kind and loving, but it's not all about you. It's all about Jesus. And bringing Him honor and bringing Him glory. And I promise you, I promise you, He knows how to bring you abundant life. Sure. And it's still going to come by following Him. I'll prove it to you. If you have little children, if you have children, period, your children would love to live life like this. Daddy, 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 fix this. Daddy, tie my shoe. Daddy, where do you want to eat? McDonald's. Not eating at McDonald's. <laughs> and they would love to live, live life like, like this. Can I tell you the way that our home is supposed to work? They follow me. Right. Now, do you want to tie your shoes? <coughs> no, I have somebody else do it. But you know, right? I make sure my shoes get tied. I'm going to be the best example when somebody can say that. When they say, Dad, look at this, do I care about the things that are going on in their life? They don't care about their life more than anybody. But in order for them to get where I want them to be, they got to follow. Right. Don't worry, along the way, he's going to care more about your life than you have a coach. Yeah, that's right. But in order for you to get past you, you got to follow. Yeah. And we cannot use Jesus as our little tool. Here's what happens. If I use Jesus as my tool, if Jesus wants to go a direction different than I want to go, then I don't allow him because he's my tool. He's my tool. Jesus says, I, I don't want you to watch that. That's not healthy for you. Listen, you're here to help me. Okay? I make the decisions. You bless. You see, that's, nobody would live that way. Oh, you'd be surprised. How often I find myself living that way. Because in the moment I wake up in the morning, it's about me. It's just naturally about me. I have to humble myself. And say, no, no, i got to follow Jesus. And instead of directing, it needs to be, he is leading, I am following, and here's the blessed part. Come and see. Come and see where Jesus dwell. Come and see where Jesus is. Come, and the Bible says that they came, they went, and they got to the place. Let's get there, we're here. We got to the place, and they dwell with him for that day. They were there together. They spent time together. They were in awe of Jesus. They were amazed by Jesus. And as they didn't 
They didn't say, well, let me, let me tell you what I've done. We've been following John the Baptist. Here's what we've done. If you know a man is lying as soon as he starts pulling up his pants and moving his shoulders. All right. Let me tell you what we've done. Right? No, no. It wasn't about all that they had accomplished. It's about what they could learn, what they could glean from Jesus. That Martha Mary principle? Martha was busy, but what was Mary doing? Sitting at the feet of Jesus. And, and Mary has chosen, chosen the better thing. And so here Jesus is coming along the way. And we are, we are, we think so much of ourselves that we don't think Jesus still is leading and we're still supposed to be following. Every day, every, the, the, the mundaneness of the example is what really is miraculous about it. He didn't say, come and see. He said, just come and see where I'm at. You want to see? You want to spend some time with me? Come and see. Now, he's going to tell Nathan a little bit later in the chapter, listen, you're going to see some more amazing things later. But what happens is, what happens is, is while, while we say, behold the Lamb of God and we want to follow Jesus, we want, we want Jesus to do a trick for us about step three. Come and see it. Well, I mean, my life's no different. Nothing's really changed. Listen, it's not about the few steps you take, it's about the destination. And spending time with Jesus. Your life will be transformed. Your life, John and Andrew and Peter and Nathan, all the, their, their lives are going to be transformed. Well, you know what it started? I'm just going to follow that. I'm just going to go where he's saying. I'm just going to sit down and talk with him. They knew who Jesus was as a person. But now, they followed him as their God. They knew who he was as, a, as an individual. But now, they believed in him as the Messiah. Listen, we got to stop believing in the religious Jesus. we got to stop believing in the historical Jesus. we got to start believing in the God Jesus. Right. Yeah. And when the God Jesus passes by and says, we follow him. And then, man, what a privilege that God, very God, would say to me, what seek ye? What seek ye? Have you had that kind of prayer time with Jesus lately? I've been pursuing you and following you and loving you, spending time with you. And God says to me, what? Seek ye? In fact, later in the New Testament, we'll have this idea. He will give me the desires of thy heart. That's the people that have been following. Mm. That's the people that have been following. And we have become spectators. Isn't it surprising? Everything in our life is spectators. And we, we, we commentate on everything we spectate. Okay? You ever watch sports with guys? Ah, oh, no, they shouldn't have run there. They should have thrown. Everybody knows they should have thrown it there. Why would you throw a pass? Why would you throw a pass on second down of the one yard line of the Super Bowl? Everybody knows you should have run. You know, everybody says, ah, oh, that's what I got to do. I got to throw it. You know what you are? You're a spectator. Thank you. I'll scream whatever you want. You're a spectator. Listen, the Christian life is not supposed to be a spectator sport. Christian life is supposed to be pursuing the Christian Christ, right. contending for the faith, following Him, putting on the armor of God, enduring hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That's what the Christian life is supposed to be. But as Christians, we have turned it into a spectator sport or at best a weekend hobby. Mm -hmm. yeah. A weekend hobby. Let's go do a little Jesus. You say, preacher, that's not a popular message. It's, it's the truth. It's the message of Jesus. He wants to be the Lord of your life. And He wants you to follow Him. And that means spend time with Him. Can I just change it up a little bit? John says Jesus is the Lamb of God. Can I tell you who else He is? He's the King of Kings. My Lord of Lords. 
the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Can you imagine the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords passing by? And you go, oh, that's nice, but this is far more impressive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's life. That's nice, but I'm way too busy. <clears throat> that's nice, but my life, I, I don't have time for that. You're passing up a chance to follow the King. To follow the Lord. To spend time with Him. To dwell with Him. Thank you, Brother Omar. Look, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Isaiah. Chapter number 57. Isaiah chapter number 57 and verse number 17. Verse number 15. Isaiah chapter 57 and verse number 15. The Bible says this, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in a high and holy place. Man, how could I ever attain to dwell with the Lord? How could I ever attain to, to spend time with the Lord? This is God, very God. He dwells in a high and a lofty place. Look what the verse says in verse 15. He dwells in a high and a holy place with him also that is of a contrite and a humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. There's nothing more humbling than following. There's nothing more contrite than following. And why do we not find ourselves dwelling with Jesus, having Jesus turn to us and seek, say to us, what seek thee? Why do we not find ourselves spending time with Jesus and being affected by Jesus and our life transformed by Jesus? Here's why. We're not humble enough to follow. We're not humble enough to follow. You will not dwell with him if you're not humble enough to follow him. I was just listening to a message. This is the way the man started out. I won't give you the way he started out. I want to be critical. But this is what he said. He said, how dare those churches believe that Jesus is the only way? Because God reveals himself in many different ways basically depending upon how the willing the person is to receive him. And if somebody's willing to receive him through Buddhism, that's how God will reveal himself. If somebody will re re receive him through Islam, that's how God will reveal himself. If somebody will receive him, he goes, and it doesn't matter if we believe what they believe, as long as they believe it, it makes it true. You're like, that's crazy. That's a wacko. Man is the president of the regular Baptist of Oklahoma. And here's, here's basically, it is offensive to say, you must follow Jesus. It's offensive to say that. You, you can study him. He's also the guy saying we should take down the Ten Commandments in Oklahoma City. It's, it's offensive to say we must follow Jesus. Can I just tell you what the Bible says? You must follow Jesus. You must follow Him in salvation in order to attain heaven, in order to have forgiveness of sins, in order to know Him as your personal Savior. You must follow Him in order to have abundance of life, in order to have fellowship, in order to have success, in order to have joy, in order to have peace, in order to have uh, understanding, in order to have anything that God would offer you, you must follow Jesus. Amen. And it is a lie to say you can get it from anywhere else. Now let me just tell you the natural, what naturally happens when you follow Jesus. So how do I know, preacher, by following Jesus? Here's what happened to Andrew. He went and found his brother and said the very same thing that Jesus said to him. Jesus said, come and see. And guess what Andrew says to Peter? Come and see. We have found the Messiah. Declarative. Definitive. It is not a question mark. It is not an if or maybe. If we have found the life-changing, uh, eternity-changing person of the Messiah. Come and see. 
Oh, preacher, you can't be so definitive. You can't be so absolute anymore. Listen, when you follow Jesus, you can't help but be absolute. When you follow Jesus, you can't help but be convinced. When you follow Jesus, it's not about the diversity of the path. It's about the singularity of the path. And you follow Jesus, and you won't be able to help along the way as you follow him to say, come and see, come and see, come and see. We have found the one that has changed our lives. And there's only two reasons that a Christian is quiet. One, because he's never truly met the master. Or two, he's not following. And so he can't direct anybody else to follow. Churches spend millions of dollars convincing their membership to tell other people about Jesus. Can I tell you what will change it? You follow Jesus. You won't be able to help but tell people about Jesus. You give up what you have, you give up your position, you give up your agenda, you give up your desire, you give up your future, and you say, Jesus, here's the blank page of my life, I follow you, you tell me what to do and where to go and how to live and, where, and the way to do it according to your scripture, not, not according to the preacher, but according to the word of God. And when God begins to transform your life, you won't be able to help but say, come and see, come and see. We do that in every other effective area in our life. I promise you, anything good that happens, anything changing that takes place in your life, you say, come and see. They open a new restaurant in Spring Hill and it's really good. Guess what you say to all your friends? Come and see. At least that's what guys like me say. Okay, because we do a lot of restaurants. Come and see. You find a new product that really works. Guess what you say? Come and see. Man, you, you, you find something that's actually decent to watch on television, you say, come and see. Man, every area of our life, anything that we're passionate about, anything that's effective or changes us, we can't help but say, come and see. So why aren't we yelling it from the rooftops to come and see Jesus? Either we have never met him or, or we've never made a decision for him. Let me change that. John and Andrew, they, they'd met Jesus, but it wasn't until that day they made a decision for him. They were religious, they were in the crowd, but that day, they went from being observers to believers. And I don't know, maybe you're here, maybe you're, maybe you're a religious person. Maybe you say, I, I believe all that, but have you ever become a believer in the person of Jesus Christ? Have you ever put your faith in Jesus Christ and said, I'm going to follow Him? Following Jesus will transform your life. Following Jesus will do something far better than that. Will get you to spend time with Jesus. I'll close with this illustration. I remember when we started the church reading some books on how to start a church and church growth. And uh, I remember reading one book and basically the person said this. In order to get people to come to church, you have to convince them that you have something that's going to help make their life better. And I understand what he was trying to say. But then he went through a list of things that simply were ways to try to make people's lives better. Can I tell you, Christianity is not about making your life better. Christianity is about introducing you to the person of Jesus Christ. Christianity is about you following him and bringing him glory. If he leads you over the mountaintop, praise the Lord. If he leads you into the valley of the shadow of death, praise the Lord. No matter where he leads you, if you're with him, it'll be enough. Because you'll be with Jesus. After Jesus died, resurrected, and the disciples started preaching. And they were amazed at their doctrine and their boldness. You know what I said? And they marked, they saw, they took note that they had spent time with Jesus. Life will be transformed if you'll be willing to follow Jesus. If you go on Facebook, I try to, I go on Facebook, I don't normally go on there to do something silly, but I go on Facebook and all these people say, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. It's become a market hashtag. I'm a follower of Jesus. You're not a follower of Jesus because you put it on Facebook. You're a follower of Jesus if you turn from your life and follow him in such a way that you have a relationship that he could turn and say, what seek ye? Right. 
Come and see. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, that you would do a work in our hearts. Lord, we may be observers. We may even be religious observers. We may even be there because we have a desire to know you and to see you. Lord, help us to not stand still as you pass by. Lord, maybe there's some here today, if they were to die right now, this very moment, they don't know where they'd spend eternity. They don't know if their sins have been forgiven. They don't know if Jesus is their Lord and their Savior. Lord, I pray that you would help them to come and see what the Scripture says this morning, that they can put their faith and trust in Christ. Even as these men made the public declaration, we have met the Messiah. May they come this morning so they can declare publicly, I have met the Lord Jesus Christ. He has forgiven my sins and He is my Lord and Savior. Lord, and I pray for the Christians, Lord, that You'd help them to stop standing on the sideline. you help them to stop being distracted by this life and this world and stop being distracted by pleasures or problems, but to be renewed in their desire to follow Jesus. To just go and see where you take them. And stop trying to direct their life. But be contrite and humble in following Christ. So that you might lead their life. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. That you would burden us. You are the Lamb of God. And as you pass by this morning, may we follow. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together. Turn.